All right, so <clears throat> we started on this series of uh, lectures or talks about, about pumps uh, back in March or late February, actually. And we had two lectures face-to-face -face before we got rudely interrupted by COVID and started working from remote locations. And then after much thought, it was decided that we should complete the series since we started it. Um, so this was the overall plan for the lectures um, is that we would have four meetings in the first one, the first and the second that we did on the ninth floor. Um, we first started talking about basic fundamentals of fluid mechanics and the second one focused more on pipe hydraulics and the specific theoretical issues that are necessary to basically figure out your the kind of systems that we are all interested in this group. And then we were uh, at the end of lecture two, we started talking about how in a system uh, of, um, of assets where the pump or pumps is uh, one or more of those installations of those assets, how to figure out how, what the specifications of that pump should be, how to size it, what the issues relating to maintenance and so on. And that was the final objective is to get there, is to get to that point. Uh, so in at the end of lecture two, we were leading into the role of pumps in the kind of systems that we're interested in. And so we'll expand on that a little bit more in today's um, today's talk. So this is the one highlighted here is basically what we're talking about today. We'll talk about pump curves and uh, what information they convey about the pump itself and its role in the system in which it's installed. Different configurations of pumps like using them in series configuration versus in parallel. Calculations related to the power necessary um, for a particular system. Um, some uh, issues uh, about maintenance and long-term durability. One of the most prominent uh, problems is uh, cavitation. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And some um, uh, physics-based uh, relationships, which are broadly called affinity laws, which is basically the relationship between the different key variables for pumps and its functionality. So in other words, if you had to uh, operate the pump at different speeds, then what does, how does that relate to the power requirements or, uh, and, and so on. So there are some, those are the underpinnings for making decisions about either upgrading a pump or determining whether it would function within a certain range. And so if it's optimized for a particular speed, then if we increase the speed for a variable speed pump, then what would be the implications of that? So the pump affinity laws kind of lay out those things. And then after today, um, I think the next one is scheduled for next week, is we'll get into something, things that are more getting away, not getting away from the theory, but talking not just about theory, but 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 more realistic kind of things. Like what, if you get a submittal from an engineer about a pump for a particular job, then what are the key things you should be looking for? And, uh, and um, then in terms of determining the appropriateness of a particular pump, or even its longevity and uh, durability in a particular system, what are the kind of things you look for? How do you come up with costing issues about pumps, not only capital costs, but also long-term and maintenance costs and so on. So we'll talk about those things next week. And and this is a list of, and, and we can, after the lecture, we can send you a PDF of of uh, all these slides so you so you have them. But these are the kind of, on the right side, the terminology will be will be sort of throwing around today. And some of the things on the left are essentially the topics that we hope to go through. Because there has been such a lag because of the situation out of our control between the second meeting and this third meeting, 
I thought I'd very quickly recap what we talked about in those first two meetings. We talked about the principle which is commonly called the continuity equation, which is essentially a statement of mass conservation in a system. And basically, if you have a closed system and the left and right inlets to that particular pump, uh, pipe are the only points at which that system is open, then the flow rate, the mass flow rate that occurs here at the inlet must equal the mass flow rate basically anywhere else. So by simply knowing the sizes of these, we can scale and figure out what the velocity will be. So in other words, if this size is reducing uh, from left to right, it's a reducer, which is a three is to one reducer, let's just say, then the area reduction will be uh, nine is to one or one is to nine and therefore the velocity increase will be 9 is to 1 in the inverse ratio. So we had a, comp a simple numerical example there. Um, <clears throat> so in this example we said diameter ratio is 2 is to 1, so the area ratio must be 4 is to 1, and so the velocity ratio is the inverse of that is 1 is to 4. That's the mass conservation. Then we talked about energy conservation in a particular system. Okay. Uh, Michael just wrote the slide of the presentation is not centered on my screen. It is partially cut. I am sharing. Hang on just a moment. Is that true for any uh, anybody else? That you're not seeing the entire slide? I chose to... Let me do this then. One moment. I was sharing that particular application and I was on full screen on my end, but but if it's not on your end, then you're missing stuff. Um, How about now? Is that any better? Michael, is that is that any better? Hopefully you guys still see the screen, yes? Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, I will I will step out from maybe my going to the, the, the slide mode or the rather the presentation mode maybe cause that. So I will just, uh, I will just stay in this mode. At least you can see the screen. And the other thing we talked about was the energy grade line or the rather the tracking of the energy at different points in um, of the fluid flowing through a system. And we came up with the terms uh, energy grade line, which is basically a plot of the pressure related energy and the elevation and the, um, and the velocity or the kinetic energy. Uh, of those three terms, uh, two of those, the pressure and the elevation, excluding the kinetic energy, are separately called the hydraulic grade line. So, even if you have a still fluid, like in a reservoir or something, where not not much flow occurring, uh, then there is no velocity, and obviously the two lines come together. But as soon as the flow exits that reservoir and flows through your system, through various sized pipes, then depending on the velocity, it will um, the two lines will separate. And you can see that right here, in that for that, by continuity, we know that the flow will speed up in the narrowed section of the pipe. And so by the total energy remaining constant, a higher kinetic energy here at the downstream end will mean a lower pressure there. 
right? So the lower pressure will reflect itself in the hydraulic grade line being lowered. Also, the separation between the two lines is kind of a measure of the kinetic energy. And so obviously the faster the fluid is flowing, the more these two lines are apart from each other. Right? So this diagram kind of brings together both the conservation of mass as well as the conservation of energy uh, for a system like that. Yikes. All right. So the next thing, um, the next thing we looked at very quickly was the loss, the friction losses in, in, a, in a pipe system and various types of pipes are rated depending on their internal roughness, the material, age, and all that stuff. Uh, their roughness is quantified, and then based on that roughness as a, as a uh, fa fraction of the diameter of the pipe, so that's called a relative roughness, and then we can have uh, different types of flow in that pipe. So you can have flow that is turbulent or flow that is laminar, uh, in the kind of systems that we are encountered, uh, encountering uh, based on the areas that we work in, we'll hardly ever see laminar flow, which for, if you wanted to throw a number around, that's approximately a Reynolds number of 2000, which is just about, just about here, is you can see that there is a curve for laminar and there's a bunch of curves for turbulent flow. Each of these curves is for a different level of roughness. So the rougher the pipe is, the higher the curve is that you choose. And then what this curve gives you, this uh, Moody diagram gives you, is a friction factor for that pipe, which then is used in an equation such as this to figure out the friction losses as a result of that kinetic energy. So you can see, obviously, it's related to the length of the pipe, and it's related to the friction characteristics of the pipe as well as how fast the flow is occurring. All three, all three, all three of those things uh, contribute to the final number. So in this particular example, we had a thousand feet of pipe. You can see L has been just put in arbitrarily as a thousand feet. And then we got 30 feet of head loss. So in other words, if you were to look this up in some, uh, in some tables, you may have it listed, that table might have it listed as so many PSI lost per 100 feet, or so many feet lost per 100 feet, or so on. So there are different ways that these tables are configured. In this particular case, we would say we have about 30 feet of loss for every 1,000 feet of pipe, OK? And 30 feet of loss is approximately 12 to 13 PSI, so you know how much, uh, how much pressure loss will take place over every 1,000 feet of pipe unless we compensate for it somehow, as in with a pump. So if you have a system like this, this was also in our previous discussion. Um, if you have a system like this, obviously, if the pump were not there, the flow would spontaneously occur from the reservoir number two on the right to the reservoir number one on the left by gravity. But if you want to force the flow from left to right instead, you would need something in between, obviously, to make up for that difference in energy. Now there are two things here. One is you can see something what's called the static head. The elevation of reservoir 1 is at 147 feet above some datum and reservoir 2 is at 230 feet. So right there there is 83 feet of what's called static head difference to overcome. Right? So you have to push the flow uh, and overcome that static head. In addition, because of the flow occurring through the system, both in the suction side of the pump, as well as on the discharge side of the pump, you're having a whole bunch of different losses, both due to friction, as well as due to various devices that you have in the, in the system, then you have to account for those. So here, in this particular case, we estimated the pipe friction loss, that number, FL over D, as 90 and all the devices and their C or K values. You'll see both uh, terminologies in different references. Some call them C values, some call them K values, but they add up to 119. So right now, then, our uh, pump is charged to do two things. One is to overcome the friction loss, uh, sorry, one is to overcome the static head, which is 83 feet, and the other is to overcome the 
the, the losses due to the combination of these two things times v squared over 2g. Okay, so that becomes an expression for what's called the total dynamic head of the pump, uh, static plus the dynamic part here. So that's where we kind of were at the end of lecture two. So if now you are given for this particular system, if you are trying to figure out the propriety, the appropriateness of a particular pump and the pump manufacturer gives you a manufacturer's curve that looks approximately like this orange line right here, and that essentially says that this pump has a shutoff head of uh, 330 feet or so, and then as the head gets lower, the discharge goes from goes to higher and higher values. So here, the numbers on the x-axis are in gallons per minute, and the head is in feet. So in other words, what we want is we want an overlap of this pump, the orange line in this system, the blue line. And the blue line is essentially constructed from that equation that we had on the previous page, and then plug in various values of discharge, Q, and because we know the pipe diameter, we can convert the discharge into a velocity, and use that velocity to calculate the total dynamic head for each one of those discharge values. So this parabolic curve was basically, is basically a plot of this equation right here, right? And these two curves now intersect at a point which is approximately at 2400 gallons per minute, which is telling us that if I put this pump in this system, the operating point uh, for this pump will be at about 2400 gal uh, gallons per minute. And so if I have other curves available for the pump, in other words, it's efficiency plot, and let's uh, bring up a couple of other things, but one thing is the efficiency of a pump varies according to the discharge that is going through it or that is delivering. And so if you know the operating discharge, then you can also figure out what the efficiency of the pump will be at that particular discharge at the operating point. You can also uh, in some cases, you can also tweak your system because remember, once you have chosen that pump, you don't have control over the orange curve, but the system itself can be tweaked a little bit by throttling valves and so on. So if you throttle a valve, essentially you are increasing the dynamic losses in the system. And so what that will do is that will bring that curve up, the blue curve up to be a slightly steeper parabola. Okay, and so it'll intersect at a different point. So you have a little bit of flexibility. In the second meeting, we also talked about when you're given a particular pump and you look at the specifications for it, the manufacturer will lay out its best operating point, and that is the point or that is the discharge at which its efficiency is is high, uh, vibration, noise, other problems are low, and as a result, long-term durability and life cycle, durability is high and therefore life cycle costs are low. So they will recommend a range saying that centered around this best operating point, there is a best operating range of discharges between which we recommend you operate this pump. Otherwise, choose something else if you are interested in a lower or a higher discharge. And then there is also a broader uh, range around that, which is an allowable operating range, which you do get some problems, but you're, I mean, you can move away uh, left or right from that operating point uh, and not cause uh, tremendous issues, but long-term issues will be worse than if you stayed close and tight to that uh, operating point that the manufacturer recommends. So there is a little bit of flexibility by tweaking our system that we can that we can move this blue curve around either to the left or to the right. Um, <clears throat> factors affecting pump efficiency. I made a list here. We don't have to go through and read everything, but uh, the different components of a pump, the motor itself, the electrical losses and so on, the impeller, the shape and the size and the spacing of impellers, 
uh, the volute itself that is being pushed around uh, within the casing and or any any mechanical losses and these are again typically arise out of operating beyond the spec so to speak um, vibration noise and so on uh, bearings and how uh, how quickly they wear down and all these things um, can be combined into a mechanical um, source of inefficiency in the pump system. So lumped together all those causes basically we can come up with an effective efficiency number so to speak uh, and typically those are multipliable so in other words if you have electrical efficiency and then you have a mechanical efficiency um, then you can multiply them to get the combined efficiency. Um, what is that term? It's called wire to water efficiency. Uh, that's basically starting at the source where you're getting the electrical energy to the amount of uh, energy that you're actually imparting to the fluid. That, be, that is a, actually the useful energy for that particular case. Then what is the ratio of those two? And that's your wire to water efficiency basically. Um, <clears throat> So here, the relationship between all the key variables and the pump power, which is basically written here as a rate of doing shaft work. So rate of doing work is basically power. So that's basically a power. I could have written P. And that's a combination of the unit weight of the fluid that's being pumped, the gamma, the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate in gallons per minute or MGD or whatever, and the total head, the total dynamic head that the pump is expected to deliver and divided by the efficiency is basically what should be the rated power of this pump. If you look at the, just the term in the numerator there, that's basically called the hydraulic power. In other words, that's the power that the fluid needs. But since the pump is operating at an efficiency lower than 100%, then this is the power that the pump must be rated at so that the product of that and the efficiency will give you the useful power that in turn then is equal to the fluid hydraulic power. Okay. And different people, depending on what common units they use, they use flow rate in either CFS or GPM or MGD and so on. So here, there are different variants of that same equation um, and that is um, these are hard numbers assuming that you know the base fluid is water and then we can adjust to any other fluid by using the specific gravity number here and then this calculation these are all in horsepower but you notice these numbers are all different because the components of the calculation are different so sometimes we have the flow rate in uh, cubic feet per second, sometimes in million gallons per day, and sometimes we have the head as expressed as an equivalent of a pressure um, increase essentially. So the relationship between head and pressure, uh, the corresponding pressure for water is the easiest thing to remember is one atmosphere is basically about 34 feet of water but it's also equal to about 14.7 PSI. So one PSI is about 2.3 feet of water, or not equal, but equivalent to 2.3 feet of water. And you can, <clears throat> so there's a numerical example here, just to give confidence in these numbers that indeed that those are okay. So depending on what system you use, you can choose, you can choose which one is most appropriate. All right, um, in terms of on either side of the pump, so you have the pump here, and then it's basically pulling water from a, from a suction, from a reservoir through the suction piping, and then delivering it to some point through the discharge, through the piping on the discharge side. And th there are two, if you take the center line of the pump as a reference, elevation then you can see that basically the suction head is how much it has to pull water or through what height it has to pull that fluid up from the reservoir and the discharge head is basically how much is the elevation of the delivery point over 
above that datum, which is the center line of the pump again. So together, the two are basically combined into the total head for that particular pump. Okay, so the static head is the difference in reservoirs like we talked about, the reservoir to the right and the reservoir to the left. Um, the difference in elevations is the static head. Part of it is on the suction side and part of it is on the discharge side. Now on the suction side, um, there is a theoretical limit that uh, that if the pump can develop a perfect vacuum, which in reality will, you'll never be able to, but if you have a perfect vacuum developed inside the pump casing, then you can theoretically have a suction head as high as one atmosphere, which is 34 feet, right? If this is, if this is open, then you can basically raise it one, one atmosphere or 34 feet. This is called the theoretical maximum suction lift. But in reality, <clears throat> for most pumps, the maximum suction lift is limited to uh, around 20 feet. About 22 feet is a practical limit for positive displacement pumps and about 15 feet for a centrifugal pump. Uh, so when you position the pump vertically, you got to you got to know you got to be uh, judicious about at what elevation to place it with respect to the reservoir and the lowest level of that reservoir uh, under the extreme conditions. So that reservoir might be like a wet well or something that is can operate uh, through a range of elevations before getting triggered and so on. But when it is operating at the low level, that's when the suction lift is being tested to the, the most, right? Um, so you have to remember the limitations that, <clears throat> that exist. Um, I know it's when we are face to face, it's easier to interact, but I can take a little pause here and in case there are any, any questions before we keep moving. Or we can keep it all until the end. It's it's your choice. All right, nobody's saying anything, so I guess I'll keep moving. We had also talked about uh, briefly. We had talked about the effect of fluid viscosity on pump power. So because you're not always dealing with clean water, and you may have at your disposal tables and charts and so on that are based on clean water at a particular temperature or whatever, but your conditions under which your pump will be operating may be significantly different, especially for wastewater applications. You can have, if you have sludge that has been sitting and then it has to be pumped, then sludge viscosity can, can uh, increase quite a bit uh, over, uh, over a period of sitting. Um, uh, undisturbed and not not flowing in but uh, and then when you have the other extreme that if you have a fluid that is kind of too thin uh, low viscosity then you can cause uh, if the pump is if the ideal operating uh, conditions of the pump are not do not correspond to a viscosity uh, that low then what you can have is you can have slip uh, in the pumps and therefore if you have slip you have less power being actually being available than what should be or what the pump is rated at. So for especially for the wastewater uh, industry it's very important to make sure that uh, your pumps are spec'd out to appropriate viscosity ranges uh, to be able to handle a fluid of the kind of viscosities that you're expected to see. And also in some cases, uh, you may need uh, the viscosity variations modeled because none of the tables and charts that you can commonly get your hands on are appropriate. So there might be more, um, there might be some back investigations that are necessary to establish if the manufacturer is not providing them is to establish what the pump's operating conditions are under uh, variations in viscosity, significant variations in viscosity. Higher viscosity fluids being pumped through will also cause um, 
greater losses um, and therefore maybe the pump has to operate at a higher speed greater loss greater cost all these things are interconnected when we talked about the pump curves earlier we had only looked at this one curve that the manufacturer provides and then looked at how that interact intersects with the system curve that would have an approximate orientation like that but here the same uh, manufacturer the same pump curves can have a set of curves such as one for efficiency one for power one for net positive suction head required and so on and this this parameter relates to the problem of cavitation oh chris had a question yes Chris, did you, uh, earlier you said you don't have a camera or mic, but so you'll have to type your question in then, I presume? I'll keep an eye out on the chat screen in case you type in something and try to address it, but I can... Um, Oh, you'll ask at the end. All right, no problem. Um, all right, so in this particular set of pump curves, we are um, we are tracking all of them, and uh, the red dot here essentially represents uh, the sh the shutoff head um, for that particular pump. Um, and then you can see that there is a, a, a downward as the as the operating head gets lower and lower, the pump is able to discharge a greater and greater uh, rate. This is that intersection we're talking about, and so if you establish that intersection there, then at that operating discharge, whatever it might be, we can essentially figure out what the efficiency is and what the net positive suction head required is and, and so on. Uh, in this case we talked about the throttling, it's like throttling the curve would basically shift that curve, the dashed curve to the left and would intersect at a different point. So if you have an interest in staying within a certain range that the that the manufacturer recommends, said that stay within a band of discharge to get best characteristics out of that pump then by throttling and so on you can probably maneuver things a little bit not a whole lot but you can maneuver things a little bit if you have different configurations uh, for example if you look at you know this is not too big on your screen but if you look at a configuration where the pumps are arranged in series so that the discharge line for one pump for pump number one is essentially connected to the suction line for pump number two and so the discharge essentially is constant right the same flow is going through all of them they're arranged in series but the head is essentially being added each pump is adding uh, a certain amount of energy to the flow and so the heads are additive so when that happens if you take the head versus discharge curve for either pump, pump A and pump B, right? And in this case, I chose the visually simple case of when the pump is identical. In other words, take the same pump and then arrange them in series. So if this is the single pump's um, H versus Q curve, to get the combination curve, you essentially stack them vertically. So you take the, the, the ordinates of this curve and you pile them on vertically to get two pumps in series. If you had unequal pumps or, or dissimilar pumps but still operating in series, the procedure is the same. It's just not would be a it would not be a doubling of the curve vertically. It would just be one stacked on top of the other. And you can see that uh, the operating point changes. So if this were the system curve which technically in this figure should have started uh, somewhere up here because of the static head, but regardless, it's got that parabolic shape. And then with one pump, the operating point was at point one, 
but with two pumps, the operating point shifted to 0.3, right? So uh, obviously, your operating point will shift, your operating discharge will shift, and, and so on. Um, and the unequal or the dissimilar pumps case is shown here, where the, a, the a, x curve and the y curve are different, but x plus y, the two operating in series, are essentially what I did was I took the ordinates of the x curve and stacked them on top of the y curve to get this new one. Um, if you have pumps operating in parallel, in other words, they are pulling from a common header and they are discharging, um, and their discharge in that case would be additive, right? So there's each pump is discharging according to its configuration, and but they're operating under the same head. In that case, you would stack these curves horizontally, and so if the single curve is here, right? If the single curve is the curve on the left, then if you stack another one of that to the right of it, then the two pumps working in parallel would be this. And you can see again, the shift from the operating point from one originally to three in the newly configured system. All right, this kind of system, the parallel configuration is very useful where you have a very highly variable discharge requirements, right? Especially like for uh, like, let's say a daily cycle of variation in typical use. Um, then uh, you can have at different times of the day, you can have a single pump running or maybe three pumps running, depending on the required discharge and uh, not have to have them running all at the same, all together, all the time. The affinity laws are here. It basically tells you that the variables involved here are flow rate, volumetric flow rate Q, the pump speed in RPM is N, and D is the impeller diameter, okay? And the relationship between flow rate is a linear prop, uh, function of the, of the speed ratio and a linear function of the um, diameter ratio. On the other hand, if you're talking about pressure, head or pressure, however you want to quantify it, uh, the relationship between the head or pressure uh, increase delivered for various configurations is quadratic with both ratios. Is the speed ratio squared and the diameter ratio squared. And the power ratio, and the power is essentially the product of Q and delta P, and obviously, therefore, it is it varies as a cube. So this helps in figuring out some what-if scenarios. Like, for example, you're trying to operate a pump at a different speed, and you're trying to figure out the cost increase as a result of operating it for at a different speed. Then the cost will be related to power, obviously. And so you can look at the the power ratio and how it'll change with the change of the of the speed of the pump. So we can see from this third one that keeping everything else, the pump, uh, assuming that this pump is not being changed, so the the impellers are exactly the, what they were, so this part doesn't change, but you're changing the speed, let's say, by 10%. By changing the speed by 10%, you will get approximately a 32, 33% increase in the power requirements and therefore in the cost of operating for however long you want to operate it. So if you're trying to get into that side, then you can use these for these relationships for a very quick estimate. So there are some examples here. We don't have to go through them number by number. Talking about cavitation, um, uh, like we said, cavitation is essentially uh, particles uh, being uh, reaching their vapor pressure or their pressure inside a pump uh, being low enough that uh, it is close enough to the vapor pressure of that fluid 
and therefore causing quote unquote boiling of the fluid. So when you think about boiling, the first thing that comes to mind is heat the water and it'll boil, but we are not messing with the pressure at that point. The pressure is constant. The other way to make a liquid boil is to bring the pressure down. And when the vapor pressure is, is low enough, then you will essentially have uh, boiling and these boiling results in forming of bubbles and these bubbles essentially they're not stable so they will break and collapse and they collapse on the parts of the pump and they cause problems like noise, vibration, corrosion and so on. So a problem for long-term durability and cost and life cycle cost and all that kind of stuff. So in our earlier discussion, I think in the first meeting, we had talked to, looked at a table like this, which is a table of properties of water, various properties such as specific weight and viscosity. And we had, because at that time we were talking about um, we're talking about Reynolds number, and so we we're interested in the viscosity and how it varies with temperature. But to the right of this table, there is this column of vapor pressure as a function of temperature. And as you can see that at a temperature of 212 Fahrenheit, which is 100 degrees Celsius, your vapor pressure is exactly one atmosphere, which is why at one atmosphere, you have the water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. So if I were to bring the uh, if I were to bring the pressure down, then I could have it boiling at a at a lower temperature, right? So, so if you think about normal water flowing through a, a pipe uh, through a pump in our typical distribution system, is between 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. In that neighborhood, if I were to if I wanted if if boiling were to happen the pressure would have to drop, the vapor pressure would have to drop to a number such as uh, less than about 0.5 PSI, okay, which is equivalent to what, about one foot, right, about one foot head. Um, <clears throat> so how can we figure out our system and what we have in our system. So if you look at a configuration such as this, a pump suction side connected to a source reservoir whose elevation is at Z1. <clears throat> the center line or the datum elevation for that pump is, is at Z2. And we have a certain length of piping obviously connecting the source to the pump. Then <clears throat> what we have is we have a few things contributing to positive pressure on the suction side of the pump. We have the atmospheric pressure pushing down we have the elevation difference Z1 minus Z2, that column of water pushing down, but we also have some losses of head loss due to friction in the system. I've shown it just for the schematic to make it fit as vertical, but it doesn't have to be. Whatever it is, the length of this piping and what's along the way, what kind of valves and bends and so on are along the way, will essentially dictate what kind of losses there are here. So if I lump all those losses as HL, head losses, so basically your positive suction head available at the suction side, a better name for this, this is always abbreviated like this, I, I don't like it, but, but a better name would be positive head available on the suction side. Um, it is a positive head, uh, but available on the suction side, is the atmospheric pressure contributing positively to it, the elevation difference contributing positively to it, the way it's shown. If the pump were to be raised, then this number would be a negative number. If the pump were to be raised above that, above that elevation of the reservoir. And then all the losses, they will definitely be a negative. So take that away, and then that gives you an idea about what kind of head is available here. And since our concern is about vapor pressure, then another definition could be net positive suction head available, which in which all we have done is we have subtracted out the vapor pressure, which means it gives us a sense of margin. How much above the vapor pressure are we? So this will depend on your configuration, where the pump is, where the reservoir is, what connects the two, and all that kind of stuff. 
right? But once we have it, then what we can do is we can compare it to the pump curve that says that at this particular discharge, whatever we are operating at, net positive suction head required, according to the manufacturer, is 25 feet, right? And we, in our system, have 37 feet. So then we can use that ratio as a factor of safety, saying that we are at 37 feet, net positive suction head available, but the pump requires 25 feet, so my factor of safety against cavitation is approximately 37 divided by 25. Okay, so there was this, there's an example here, which when I send you the document, you'll have it. Uh, so we calculated based on all of this, we calculated a net positive suction head required was given to us. And then based on a factor of safety of two that we want against cavitation, we want a net positive suction head available of 24 feet. So the question was, what is the highest elevation at which we can place the pump and still have this? So all this was put in and that gave us the elevation of the pump must be less than or equal to 270 feet in this case. So if we raise it any higher, we don't have that factor of safety of two at the suction site. Okay. How am I doing on time? 2.50. All right. Just to give you an idea about, <clears throat> I need to make this bigger. Give you an idea about a practical cut sheet of a pump in a particular system. Because that um, full screen thing was causing problems for folks, I I am juggling different things on screen. Okay, so you can see here that move this to that side. All right, so what do we have here? We have here, there's a lot on one screen. <clears throat> okay, so there's a power curve as a function of, um, of um, the discharge. We have an efficiency curve, the top one on the bottom part of the figure. And then we have these pump curves, which are head versus discharge curves. There are two of them because one of them, I believe, was for a larger size impeller. So if you look at the cut sheet, it says that this particular pump is available in different impeller diameters. And the uh, impeller diameter right right there you can see right here the one that we are using is a 20.19 inch diameter and the range is from 16.7 to 20.98 so i think the two curves that you see here are the actual the 20.19 the curve for the 20.19 inch diameter impeller and the maximum sized impeller and so this is the shut off head for that particular pump with that size impeller. It's approximately 62 feet, which you can see uh, maximum head at rated diameter right here is 62.64 feet. Um, once we take that curve, once we take that curve and we intersect it with our system curve, uh, this, I'm trying to see here, oh, that the system curve is actually not shown here, but <clears throat> it was established based on the system curve that the operating discharge is the best efficiency point is 4823. That simply relates to 
the efficiency plot and at what point it is it is highest so 4823 seems to be about here that seems about right the highest point of the efficiency curve we are at that operating point which is about 4200 uh, gallons per minute I'm trying to see where that was <clears throat> Ah, must, must, some of the notes are on this side. So the efficiency sorry this job. if I was on full screen it would be a little bit better. Okay. So the operating discharge was 45, 60 gallons per minute. That is if the system curve had been in place and you could see the intersection, the intersection would have been there. And that, that's where everything flows from. So once I know that that is the, that is the Q that we are interested in, sorry about this juggling, then at 4560 where this dashed vertical line has been drawn then we can figure out what the efficiency is and what the power is and so on and if you take a look i mean i'm probably giving people a headache by switching back and forth across the different parts of the screen so what i did was i highlighted many of the things in fact most of the all of the things here you can you can sort of see from this diagram but this sheet to accompany this diagram and these highlights about what is coming from what part of that plot is useful if you're given uh, a as part of a submittal let's say you're given a set of curves that saying how would this be in our system that we are considering now we know our system we know what the system curve is and we do an overlap of that system curve with the operating curve and that's where it all begins and on the left side of this slide is all the information that you can then subsequently pull from that intersection and the calculations that you can make from it so in this case the hydraulic power if you go back to the <clears throat> formula involving q and h and so on you'll see that hydraulic power 43.8 that is going to be confirmed by the information in that table and so on okay so since uh, you may be in that position as to determining either determining uh, uh, or picking a pump for a particular scenario or judging the appropriateness of some of a suggestion saying that okay we are suggesting we use this pump for the system then if you are as an engineer then judging that submittal then the, some of the key things that you're looking for are kind of highlighted here. All right, so that puts me at an hour, which is what our intent was to talk and then take questions. Um, some of the some of the things hopefully we have talked about. Uh, everything that's in this list affinity laws best efficiency point cavitation hydraulic power positive suction head series and parallel operation and throttling vapor pressure for cavitation all right I am, if there are any questions, we can address them. I don't know why my, what happened to my chat window. Wow.
I don't know if anybody is typing in questions yet, but for some reason the chat window went dark. Okay, let me see what this. I see one chat message came in, but I can't read it. Let me see if I can fix this. Oh, hang on. Technology is only good when it works, you know? When I'm clicking on that chat window, it's minimizing my control panel and not showing me what's on chat. Chris, I assume this was your question because you said you don't have a mic on. Sorry about that. Uh, I've never had that happen to me. Okay. Okay, I see it now, finally. No, Michael asked, Chris said, could I email you an operations rain event scenario regarding pump suction loss? Yeah, sure. Are, uh, are you planning to send the PDF slides to attendees of the presentation? Yes, I was going to do that. Um, because we didn't, some of the slides, we just, the ones with the numerical examples and so on, we kind of, rush through them and saying that you'll have a copy. You can take a look and go through it and I'll uh, happily take questions follow up by email. But that was a plan to send the PDF slides. All right. So Nick, okay, another one. Ahmed says, is there an equation between the RPM of the pump and the net positive suction head required? Uh, is there an equation? I I can I can look into it. I'll give you the honest answer. I don't know, uh, but I can look into it because. I believe that that is established empirically because there is so much variable within the pump. I mean, the, the slight differences in casing shape and and uh, uh, and so on that I don't think. I mean, there might there must be a theoretical basis for it, but the question for the benefit of everyone else was that. Is there an equation relating the RPM of the pump and the net positive suction head required, which is given by the pump manufacturer? My first instinct is it's established by them empirically by doing tests, by saying that uh, by testing it at various um, um, at various conditions and then seeing at which point do certain issues start to manifest themselves and so on, and then using some kind of factor of safety, establishing a desirable uh, net positive suction head required. Okay, that, that's, that's my instinct. But there might, there, there might be more to it. I can, I can find out. Well, you know, Ahmed, since you're a mechanical engineer, whenever I used to have to teach anything with pumps, uh, I used to sort of, if I had to give a uh, cop out answer. I used to say, I'm a civil engineer. I just deal with, I, I'm just a consumer. I just use the pump. The, manuf the mechanicals manufactured it and tested it. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I will look, I will look into it because I don't know either. It would be nice to know. All right, 
if there are no other questions, we can. Uh, Michael says net positive suction head required are coming from the manufacturer as a function of the pump design. True. Uh, the question was, is there some kind of a theoretical relationship like we looked at those uh, affinity laws, like there are some like either a quadratic or a cubic variation. Um, is there such a theoretical relationship between the speed of the pump and the net positive suction head required? They typically look parabolic to me, but you know, at, when the curve near the origin, there's very little difference between a parabolic and a cubic curve. They kind of look the same. So I don't know exactly. I'll see if I can find out. All right. No other questions and I can we can stop there.